911 or is your emergency? A spring morning, a little girl begs a neighbor for help. Yes, a little girl had come to my house. I lived on Green Springs Road in, in Donald, Georgia. Uh -huh. And said uh, she needed some help that her papa was dead. As emergency operators listen, the gruesome details worsen. Can you ask her how they killed him? She doesn't know. What has happened at 1200 Green Springs Road? Her mother lies dead nearby her father, too. Her husband is on the run. I'd just love to hear your side of the story. What sent you over the edge like this? Who has killed Mrs. Jessica Neal? KZ 106, right now traffic on the big show. Jessica Miller, a familiar, friendly face in Dalton, Georgia. She was really well liked, young, about 27 years old, blonde, tan. Born one of five children in Atlanta, Georgia on September the 11th, 1984, Jessica was a single mum after having her baby Maddie at the age of 18. She was really close to her daughter, and you know, they just had a wonderful relationship, it sounds like. Not long after having Maddie, Jessica met Adolf Neal, known as Sonny. They had met while she was a contestant in a, uh, like a pageant, like a beauty pageant. Sonny let everyone know he was smitten, 22 years older than Jessica. He was a property developer embedded in the community. He had a lot of friends. He had an adult daughter from a previous marriage, and they were very close. Sonny was not known as an unfriendly guy. Sonny had friends. Sonny had associates. Sonny had people that cared about him. At first, Jessica's family were concerned about the age difference, but Sonny succeeded in charming them, as well as Jessica, still a teenager when they met. Her parents told me that he was real charismatic, real charming. There was a large age gap between the two. Um, when they married, Jessica was 19 years old. Um, uh, Sonny Neal at the time was around 41 years old. Sonny also got on well with Jessica's young child. And in 2004, it looked like the family was complete. Sonny adopted uh, Jessica's daughter after they got married, and they seemed to have a really good relationship. Sonny loved Madeline treated her very well, had actually adopted Madeline. You know, it seemed to say something, I guess, about his character, that he was willing to treat her like his own. Sonny, Jessica, and Maddie moved to a new home in Green Springs Road, Dawnville, which they shared with an extended family. Jessica's grandfather, Donald Shedd, lived at the residence with Jessica and Sonny. <laughs> The family home needed to be big. Sonny's elderly grandfather, who suffered with Alzheimer's, soon had to be cared for here too. Despite the challenges, this appeared a happy home. From the outside, the marriage of Sonny and Jessica Neal appeared to be a solid marriage. They appeared to be happy together. They would go out a lot. They would uh, post photos on social media where uh, they were out at local establishments, um, you know, winding down, having a good time together. Friends would say, you know, he was really known for making her laugh. Um, they were real close. Uh, their marriage seemed to be well for a long time. Uh, Sonny was very uh, fond of his wife. Um, uh, he was very almost, uh, some of the friends described him as um, almost being obsessed with her. With Sonny's help, Jessica set up a business on Cleveland Highway, just 10 minutes away from their home. She and Sonny owned a tanning salon and that was their business that they had together. Jessica's uh, friends and family said that she was very outgoing. 
She was kind of the face of their business, and so anyone who went into their tanning salon knew her. She was kind of the life of the party as well, wherever she went, and just had a real you know, love for life. Meanwhile, Sonny continued to expand his own interests. They were looking at going into business with Jessica's father, who was wanting to open a, a sports bar and grill here uh, in Dalton. Sonny had multiple rental properties that he uh, owned and managed, uh, and he, of course, uh, dedicated some of his time to, uh, to that as well. A happy house, a striving business couple, wedded bliss. But few know what goes on behind closed doors. Fault lines were appearing in the marriage. They kind of portrayed themselves as this perfect couple, no problems. But um, I think there was a lot going on below the surface. He was prone to become very angry and was very possessive over Jessica. He definitely seemed controlling and, and jealous and wanted to kind of keep a tight um, grip on her. Whenever they went out socializing, Sonny seemed to tighten that grip. When they would go out to local establishments uh, together, he and his wife, there was several times that uh, it was reported he had gotten into fights uh, with, with other men, um, supposedly over them flirting with Jessica, or he had took something as meaning something that maybe it wasn't in regards to his wife. Sonny and Jessica's perfect picture was proving to be an illusion. Things were definitely going downhill. Their relationship had hit a rocky patch. Uh, they had uh, begun to differ in which direction that they wanted to go individually. He had started acting differently, was just not acting as self. Sonny seemed to change friends and family began noticing odd things. They were on the phone with Jessica and they could hear Sonny in the background and they could hear them arguing. They admitted that Sonny had changed, that he wasn't acting himself, that he was saying things that were unlike him to say, things that were out of his head, and that he had made uh, statements that concerned them, that, that he was, they were, they were worried about Sonny. They were afraid that he might try to do something to himself. When I spoke with Jessica's mother, she told me things really changed for the couple. And, you know, he went from seeming charismatic to controlling. And that really, in her words, he was a charismatic narcissistic sociopath. Strong words from an anxious mother had the family's initial concerns about Sonny been right all along. The atmosphere inside the family home in Green Springs Road began to deteriorate. Donald Miller, Jessica's grandfather, noticed. Sonny and Donald did not get along. And this was mainly due to the fact that Donald being Jessica's uh, grandfather would take Jessica's side when there was the arguments. Sonny's possessiveness stepped up to new levels. Friends said, you know, he became very controlling. He didn't like her to go to the bathroom without him. I mean, she was always like looking over his shoulder. Sonny had, uh, on a couple of occasions, been violent towards Jessica. In early 2012, eight years into their marriage, Sonny Neal discovered that his worst fears had materialized. Jessica was having an extramarital affair, and Sonny knew about it. We learned that he had discovered that his wife was having a relationship with another man. Jessica didn't try to deny the affair. Instead, she suggested that her marriage to Sonny was over and that the couple should divorce. Jessica told her stepmom that she was going to leave Sonny, even though he had begged her to stay, give him another chance, work it out. Um, she was insisting that, you know, it was over. Despite all his efforts to control his wife, Sonny Neal was staring at the prospect of losing the perfect family life that he'd felt he had created. The effect in him appeared to be devastating. Sonny did not want a divorce. Uh, he wanted things to work out and had actually told one of his friends that all he wanted was for his family to get back together. Sonny was uh, very unhappy and his range of emotions over 
those weeks uh, begin to deteriorate. He uh, had been drinking a lot and had been on some medication, prescribed medication, uh, but was drinking about every day. Sonny had lost a considerable amount of weight. I believe one friend had said it looked like he had lost 30 or 40 pounds. Criminologists point to this moment when a woman decides she's leaving as very dangerous. In 2020, 41% of women murdered by their partners were killed once they had tried to leave. Had Jessica signed her own death warrant with the revelation that she was leaving Sonny? Yeah, I'm just uh, unsure what to go in the house. I mean, uh, if it has been, a, you know, a murder or something. Twenty twelve, Sonny Neal's marriage is on the rocks, and his businesses were in trouble too. Sonny and Jessica were having some financial problems, which was causing additional strains on the marriage. In the spring of 2012, Sonny was hit by a personal tragedy. On top of that, Sonny's uh, brother, who we were told he was very fond of, had passed away. It was one more blow to his crumbling life. He was drinking heavily, had been prescribed alcohol addiction pills. He was depressed not only about his marriage, but he was also depressed about his brother dying. So all these things had caused the relationship to become very rocky. On the night of May 23, 2012, the storm that had been brewing for Sonny and Jessica Neal finally broke. With the, the stress on the marriage, the financial problems, his brother's death, uh, the alcohol prescription pills, we believe just exploded. At around 9.30 that evening, Sonny put his adopted daughter Maddie to bed at the Green Springs Road home. She recounted how her father came up and tucked her into bed. Sonny uh, hugged Madeline and told her that he loved her and that uh, he wanted her to have a good night's sleep. For some reason, Jessica wasn't around to put Maddie to bed that night. She said her mother did not come up that night to do that. In fact, Jessica was out by the pool where she had made contact with her father. According to Chattanooga crime reporter Joy Lukachik smith who covered the story, she sounded terrified. She texted her father. He, he showed me the text later and said, um, I believe it said, all hell is breaking loose, is what she told him. And so he asked her, do you want me to come over? What do you want me to do? She told him, though, she had it handled. Could Jessica really handle her obsessively jealous husband? The couple were spotted together. The last physical contact with Sonny and Jessica Neal was around 10 o'clock that night by a neighbor who was outside and waved to Sonny as he and Jessica were walking out toward the, the swimming pool. Sonny waved back and motioned as if asking the neighbor to come down with them, which he had done before. However, he was wanting to watch a uh, ball game, so he declined and went back in his house. Instead of chilling with their neighbor by the pool, Sonny and Jessica got into another fight, and not one of their standard fights either. Sonny Neal's rage and jealousy exploded into violence. Jessica was stabbed and bludgeoned with a medieval looking knife that had a handle in which you inserted your hand into the handle. Combat style knife with a grip that had uh, metal spikes coming out from the grill. And the blade was probably six, eight inches long. That was the instrument that was used to murder uh, Jessica. It was a frenzied, merciless attack. Well, any time that you have a murder, in which the victim is stabbed or beaten to death. That's a very personal murder. In order to kill somebody with a knife, you've got to be right there face to face with them, up close and personal. And it is a very, very indicative that it is a, a murder of passion. It's a murder of, of anger uh, and incited by those very things. You know, it seems like a textbook crime of passion. It's beyond what you can imagine that someone supposedly who loved 
you know, her and took her grandfather in, in his own home, um, would be so up close and personal like that and commit that kind of an act. I, it was hard to stomach. Barefoot, leaving a trail of bloody footprints behind him, Sonny went into the house to face the man who had pushed back on his granddaughter's behalf against Sonny. He went inside the residence and found Jessica's grandfather in the kitchen. Armed and covered in his wife's blood, Sonny launched a furious attack on Donald Shedd and beat him to death in the head with a hammer. Once he had killed Jessica, uh, then there was no downside to killing her father, Donald. He probably was first impacted upright and then hit the ground and the beating continued from there. At the location of Donald's body was a voluminous amount of blood spatter that was low to the ground, which would indicate that Donald was beaten while he laid on the floor. Sonny Neal's nine-year-old adopted daughter and others in the house lay asleep just yards away from the bloody scene. And that would have been fairly close to Maddie's bedroom and Robert's bedroom, which were right across from one another. However, neither one of them recounted hearing anything during that night. Seven o'clock the following morning, and Maddie makes the horrific discovery. Uh, Madeline was the one that had awakened on May the 24th and had found her grandfather uh, beaten to death in the kitchen. When she saw him, she ran immediately to a neighbor. The neighbor told me that she said, somebody killed my papa. The neighbor in Green Springs Road listened to her extraordinary, chilling story. And then the 911 call was made. What's going on? Where's your emergency? Yes, ma'am. One girl had come to my house. I live on Green Springs Road in, in Donald, Georgia. Uh -huh. And said uh, she needed some help, but her papa was dead, uh, laying on the floor. How old is the little girl? How old are you? She's nine. And what's her name? What you, what's your name? Maggie Neal. As emergency services are called into action, the operator keeps Maddie's neighbor on the line. Is that what you said? Is that someone in the building? Yeah, and then my mom and dad She said her mom and dad disappeared and they're not there. She don't know. With the neighbor relaying questions to Maddie, the operator finds out more about what has happened at the Neil home. OK. Did she see him laying in the floor? You did see him laying in the floor? Had blood all over him. Okay. Within minutes, police officers arrive in Green Springs Road. Lieutenant Scott McAllister was one of the first detectives to be called to the scene. I was putting my tie on at the house and I got a phone call from my supervisor. Uh, who asked me to be en route to uh, 1200 Green Springs Road, um, which was only about a five minute drive from my home. I've been in law enforcement for 25 years. And to this day, this crime scene was the most brutal crime scene that I have um, been to. Officers from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation were not far behind the police. I think my name is Daniel Sims, and I'm a special agent in charge of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The job of the GBI is to assist uh, local agencies and county agencies in the um, apprehension of fugitives, the investigations of criminal events that happened that may cross jurisdictional line. It was in the early morning hours uh, that I got uh, called by um, a captain from the uh, Whitfield County Sheriff's Office requesting the uh, help of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation in what appeared to be a double homicide at 1200 Green Springs Road in Dalton, Georgia. A double homicide and someone missing. Maddie's stepdad, Jessica's husband, Sonny Neal. Where was he?
One of the immediate jobs that Dan Sims had to undertake was talking to little Maddie Neal. Madeline was my first interview. Shortly after I got on the scene and uh, what I saw was something that a nine-year-old girl should never have to go through. She was distraught. She was visibly shaken. She was crying. And in a perfect world, I would have never interviewed her on that day. But she was the only person that could lead me toward a truthful path. As expected from the 911 call, they found the smashed up corpse of Donald Shedd in the kitchen of the family home. But worse was to come. They had discovered a second body, uh, a deceased uh, white female um, that was laying in the pool house um, and that she appeared to have been uh, stabbed multiple times. There was a wealth of evidence at the scene which all pointed in one direction. It became apparent very early that Sonny was going to be the focus of the investigation. And when you look at a bare, bloody footprint, it leads you to the quick conclusion that whoever was there committing this murder was comfortable enough to have their shoes off while they're committing this murder. There was a bloody patent fingerprint found on the door that would have matched Sonny's fingerprints. And the knife that was used during the murder uh, had a box that was found in Sonny's master bedroom closet. So that weapon was associated very quickly with Sonny. Agent Sims was also able to collect vital information from Sonny's adopted daughter. During uh, our interview with Madeline, she stated that her dad was wearing swimming trunks and a t-shirt when he came to tuck her into bed. During the crime scene examination, we found wet, bloody uh, swim pants or swim shorts uh, at the scene. Also, T-shirts with uh, blood stains in them. Also, water-tinged blood here and there within the marital bedroom. So we believe that after he killed Jessica, that he jumped in the pool to cleanse himself off, which sort of made a watery, bloody mess instead of, it's, it's hard to clean yourself up after, after a murder like that. There was more than enough evidence in the house and around the pool for homicide detectives to arrest Sonny for the murder of his wife and her grandfather. We were suspecting him, had plenty of probable cause to point the finger at him to the point where we secured murder warrants on day one. The evidence that we obtained at the scene the day of the incident confirmed that Sonny Neal was our offender. Our issue at that point was to find Sonny Neal. Sonny Neal had disappeared. There's plenty of cover for a fugitive in this part of Georgia. He didn't leave in a car to our knowledge. He did not carry his wallet away. He did not take his cell phone with him. Uh, so as far as we knew, he had no financial means. He had no transportation means uh, that we knew of and that he had actually left the residence on foot. We realized that we had a fugitive that was on the loose in our county, uh, which is uncommon. Sonny obviously either left in a panic, taking nothing with him, or Sonny left leaving everything behind on purpose. Police launched a manhunt, but Sonny fleeing the scene without his phone or anything else created a problem. In today's world, all the conventional ways of tracking somebody, they go out the window when those things happen and you find yourself back in uh, a more old fashioned day and age where you're looking for somebody that is not only in the wind somewhere, but they're in the wind without telecommunications, they're in the wind without cellular telephone signals. Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents were working on the basis that there are certain patterns that criminals on the run tend to follow, not good ones. Where somebody is in fugitive status, usually they're going to commit further crimes. 
They're gonna commit a burglary in order to eat. They're gonna commit a robbery in order to get some money. They're gonna commit a carjacking or an auto theft to get some transportation. None of that was happening in this case. So what had happened to Sonny Neal? Was the hunch that he was still in the area correct? Or had he somehow managed to escape the scene altogether? When we didn't hear from him on day two or day three or day four or day five, we began to really wonder, has Sonny slipped underneath the radar screen? And has, has he had somebody help him get out of town? There was, I think, over 100 police from all over the region that spent a week just combing the area, looking for him. Until we knew for sure that we had him captured and in custody, uh, we had a community that we needed to uh, look out for and to protect. Reporters from Georgia's newspapers and television stations told the state it was on high alert. One of the upsides of this investigation, we were able to utilize the, uh, the local media out of Chattanooga and Atlanta. Uh, and, and the media really helped us in this investigation. They put out his picture everywhere. We had him in the newspaper, he was on television, trying to get everybody to help. They did not relent. They were on this case every day because they knew that Sonny was uh, at least dangerous, if not armed. We had a lot of people trying to help us. Uh, we were getting all sorts of telephone tips, uh, we were getting a lot of leads that we'd follow the leads and they'd sort of end in a dead end. Six days into the manhunt, a breakthrough. A customer from Jessica Neal's tanning salon spotted someone near to the Dollar General store at the junction of highways 2 and 201 in Varnell, about 10 miles north of Dalton. That area in North Georgia is pretty small, small town. Um, and so most people knew you know, Jessica and Sonny in that area. We got a call from a citizen to the sheriff's office. And um, she claimed, I I've seen Sonny. And she, you know, like jumped up and was like, you know, started shouting at her husband and, you know, could barely grab her phone because she was so, you know, just couldn't believe that she was seeing him. It was the strongest tip off the police had received so far, but was it right? Now we've got to decide what to do with this investigative lead. How, how do we respond to this? Because we had had other potential sightings of Sonny that led nowhere. Manhunts are, are labor intensive and they take up a lot of personnel. They take up a lot of manpower and man hours. We decided to take it ultra seriously. With a command post set up in a nearby parking lot, the GBI focused their search on the area. And we quickly assembled every man we could. We had roving patrols, we had dogs, we had helicopters with infrared sensors. We were really pulled out all the stops trying to find Sun. Were law enforcement officers about to get their man? We were really hopeful that the infrared camera would find Sonny somewhere in the woods, and it just didn't happen that evening or night. Despondent and worried, Special Agent Dan Sims and his team began to wonder if their tip-off had been a mistake. The next morning, they got a call from the local police. Varnell Police Department is in very close proximity to that location. I got a call that Sonny had been sighted in a wood line uh, in that same area and had been apprehended by local police officers. So units with Varnell PD and deputies with the Whitfield County Sheriff's Office responded and was able to take Sonny Neal into custody without any incident. When police finally picked him up, Sonny Neal was a physical wreck. Sonny was in the woods and in the wilderness for seven days, and that he had not drank much water, if at all, and he had not eaten anything. He had not robbed anybody or did a burglary to eat. He had not walked into a convenience store and shoplifted something to, to subsist on. He was very dehydrated and had scratches and cuts on his legs and his body from being out 
in the elements. I was astounded at what I saw. Um, Sonny looked decimated. He was eat up from head to toe with insect bites. Uh, he looked, and I'm no doctor, but he looked visibly dehydrated. And I said, Sonny, are you sick? And he nodded his head yes, and I immediately asked for an ambulance to take him to the hospital. The fugitive was in police custody, being treated for exposure and injuries that he had sustained whilst hiding out in the woods. It turned out he was found just a few miles from where he'd murdered his wife and her grandfather. Detectives finally had the chance to question their suspect. Did you get to sleep? No. Okay. The, the nurse had told me that, that, you're, that, you, that you're suffering from poison oak a little bit. Do you want me to have her come? And, and give you some medicine for that? Yeah. They take care of you up at the hospital? Yes, sir. Yeah, there's some good people up there. Yes, sir. Was Sonny Neal about to confess to the double homicide? Or did he have one more card to play? I'd like to have an attorney present. OK. If they wanted their suspect to talk, Special Agent Dan Sims and Lieutenant Scott McAllister were going to have to play a cat and mouse game of diplomacy. Sonny, do you want coke or water or anything? You sure? I'll get it for you. Okay, all right, we'll be with you in just a minute. Agent Sims and, and I attempted to interview Sonny Neal after his arrest. When we approached Sonny Neal about speaking with him about these incidents, he began to cry and his legs were shaking uncontrollably. Sonny was going to need delicate handling. I got, I got the opportunity to meet your little girl. She's a sweet little thing. Sonny, before we decide whether we're gonna to talk today or not, let me, let me just go over a couple of things with you, and I'll, I'll let you know sort of what I know. I told you I wouldn't try to trick you, fool you, push you, pressure you, and I, and I won't do that. As the interview goes on, the officers try a number of tactics to get him to talk. As I said yesterday, there, there's not much I don't know about this thing. I'd just love to hear your side of the story. Uh, it, it's, it's not going to hurt me that much if you don't talk to me, but. But I just love to hear it. Uh, and whatever you tell me, I'll make sure it's documented exactly. Uh, I think that a, that a lot of people that love you and care about you are going to want to know why. You know, what, what sent you over the edge like this? And I, I think, I think that's, that's a fair question from your loved ones. But at the same time, I think that it does provide a lot of explanation as to to, to what, to what sent you. Nothing convinces Sonny Neal to open up about the night of the murders. And then... I'd like to have an attorney present. Okay. Okay. What you, what you just did under the law is that you invoked an attorney. And I'm not allowed by law to question you because of that. It was the end of the line for the investigator's interview. He realized that, uh, that he was in big, big trouble. And he realized he needed an attorney. And uh, I agreed with him. He did need an attorney. And to this day, he's never spoken to law enforcement about any details of this uh, double murder. I just think it was one of those cases where Sonny knew it was over and he was gonna to have to face the consequences of what he did. Nine months after the double homicide in Green Springs Road, Sonny Neal appeared before a judge. When they brought Sonny in, he was shackled and was wearing like a jumpsuit. And he didn't, he didn't look as much like his picture. I remember being surprised by that. I think he had put on some weight. Um, and looked older, but he really didn't have any emotion as far as I remember. He just sat there. 
Speaking on behalf of Sonny was his attorney, Marcus Morris. Mr. Morris stated during the plea that the combination of Sonny's uh, recent discovery of his wife's uh, infidelity, the death of his brother, his financial problems, his marriage crumbling, and his recent uh, drinking and use of prescribed prescription medication had ultimately uh, resulted in his actions. His attorney read a statement in court that said, you know, that he was sorry for what he had done. And this isn't a person that just decided to kill two people. That was it. I tend to disagree with with his statement simply because regardless of uh, what may have been going on in Sonny's life, regardless of, of issues and problems that, that he may have been having, nothing justifies what I saw on May the 24th, 2012. Sonny is one of these people that is in prison because he could not control his temper. In Georgia, he he probably could have gotten the death penalty. But he did not. In fact, the case never went to trial. A deal was struck. Sonny Neal uh, entered a guilty plea. They accepted the um, prosecutor's decision to, to give Sonny a plea deal for uh, two counts of murder without the possibility of parole. They were shielding Jessica's daughter. They didn't want her to testify, and they just didn't want her to have to relive that and, you know, the, the distress that it would cause her. They were protecting her. He got uh, life without parole for the killing of Donald Shedd, and he got life for killing Jessica. So Sonny will spend the rest of his life in prison. While Sonny didn't show any emotion, his family showed a ton of emotion. It was really actually a dramatic moment in court. Sonny Neal's attorney during the plea agreement stated that Sonny Neal was remorseful for his actions. At the end of the day, I don't know whether he was remorseful for his actions or, or not. That's something that will probably remain between him and God. Since climbing up at his interview, Sonny has never spoken about what drove him to kill his wife and her grandfather. I never really got a good sense of, you know, what made a person who seemed, you know, fairly normal and likable just, you know, snap and commit, you know, extremely heinous crime. There's only three motives for murder, sex, anger, and greed. This was certainly a sexual motive. It was certainly an anger motive. It certainly appeared like a crime of passion, I mean, in, in the moment. Jessica's murder was one that was incited by passion. It was incited by anger. It was almost like when a, a pressure cooker goes off and releases its steam. He, he had definitely crossed the line in a spontaneous moment where he just lost it and attacked Jessica. And what about Donald Shedd, Jessica's grandfather, who shared the family home with them? The question of how Donald was murdered and, and the motive why Donald was murdered was an answer that we sought for, for quite a while. And we believed that Donald's murder was a motive of anger. Uh, he was very angry at Donald. Sonny Neal will spend the rest of his life in prison for killing his wife, Jessica, and her grandfather, Donald Shedd. Sonny gave his nine-year-old daughter, Maddie, a life sentence of her own. One of the most stunning parts of this case was the fact that Sonny Neal had brutally murdered his wife and Donald Shedd there at the residence, and then had left the residence knowing that his adopted nine-year-old daughter was still there in the residence sleeping and would wake up and would find this 
uh, these murders had occurred. I still have a hard time with the fact that, that Maddie discovered the crime scene. I really haven't thought about this case since because I can't. It's it's not it's not something, you know, especially having children now, it's not something you want to think about. The rage, the heinous actions that were involved in the brutal stabbing of his wife and the beating uh, to death of of Donald uh, is an unacceptable way uh, to handle any situation. That amount of rage can never be excused, regardless of the circumstances. There was a nine-year-old girl in the middle of all this. She didn't just lose her mother. She didn't just lose her grandfather. She lost her dad, too.